This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. You will rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you've had a good day, a good week. Whew. We finished the turkey, or just about finished the turkey. You probably, if you're like me, you're going to have leftovers today. But we just thank God that He has provided for us. And as I said last week, every day is a day of thanksgiving. And God is so good to each and every one of us. So we need to give Him thanks today and let it be continuously in our mouth, in our mind, in our heart. Because God has been good to all of us. And we've got a beautiful lesson today that's helping us to deal even when things may not be going like we plan or want them to go. But we are still to bless the Lord. With that being said, let us have a little talk with Jesus. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, our life, our health, and our strength. And we ask you, Lord, to teach this Bible study. Use me, Lord, your vessel. Decrease me and you increase, Lord, so that your word can go forth and that it can reach the masses. Lord, forgive me, those that are watching, of anything that we said, thought, or done that was not pleasing to you and that can hinder us from getting even close to you. Strengthen us, Lord, and take away those barriers that's keeping us from getting close to you. Lord, we pray for the peace of Israel and the nation of Israel. We pray, Lord, you know the war is going, you know everything. So, Lord, it's in your hand. But we lift them up to you, Lord. Lord, we pray for every nation, every country, every world leader, Lord. We pray for them. We pray for the leaders of America. You know, Lord. And Lord, help us to be good witnesses for you. Lord, I'm praying and seeking each and every day how we can be available for you. Lord, I'm lifting up the preachers, the ministers, the lay people, the evangelists, and all of those who are in your vineyard working for you. Lord, just continue to strengthen us and let us remember, Lord, that although situations around us may be in turmoil, let us remember, Lord, that the joy of you is our strength. We pray for all the sick, shut in, the bereaved, those who are incarcerated, but most, Lord, we mostly pray for those who have not accepted you for the free pardon of their sin. Touch them, Lord, as only you can. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. As I said, we have a beautiful lesson today. Talk about Brother Job. And we know that he went through a lot. And the title of the lesson is, When Tragedy Occurs. When Tragedy Occurs. And it's taken from Job. Uh, the first chapter. Verses 14 to 15. And then verses 18 to 19. And 22, and then the third chapter, verses 1 to 3, and verse 11. And i just like to say that we've had about three or four deaths since I've talked to you last. And you think about, Lord, how many more am I going to have to go to? But God calls to roll every day, every second, someone is going home. But we know God, the Holy Spirit, as a comforter. And He will comfort. So, those who are still going through, I lift up, I lift you up, the Burgess family. The family of Sister Annie Burgess and 
I lift up the family, the Cooper family, the family of Mary Cooper. And I lift up the Mickey Hill family, the Bidding family. And we have a new one, little precious, who was in a car accident. Flo, Teresa, her mother, Christine Sand, and all the family. You in our prayers and our thoughts. I tell you, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. He can heal you even at such a time as this. And we're going to get into the lesson because we're going to see where God struck Job's house and all ten of his children were gone at the same time. But he still kept his stance with Christ, with God. And we have to have that steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the Word of God. Because we know that our work, our labor, shall not, will not be in vain. Job, when tragedy occurs and it's taken for him, Job and you know how we do we always do a little background here we want to talk about brother Job first Job is the central character in the book of Job may have lived during the times of Abraham Isaac and Jacob so we know that this kind of like passed those books of uh, Moses but this is saying that it was we don't know but it could have happened much earlier than we think he was perfect and upright he feared God and he hated evil Job 1 1 he was a responsible husband and father and was richly blessed with material goods. He had good health and was highly respected by others. In other words, Job was the greatest of all the men of the East. God's intimate friendship blessed his house. And they say he was a perfect and upright man. Now we know that there was only one perfect man that's walked to serve. But he what is saying that he tried his best to do right and to follow God's way. That's why he was perfect and upright. Because he was going in the right direction by following God. The land of us. Bible scholars tell us that the location is uncertain. Some believe, however, that it was in the Arabian or Syrian desert, east of Palestine, east of the Jordan River, near Canaan, Israel, where the Israelites would later live. Limitations in Genesis suggest that us was in the vicinity of Edom. From the scriptures, most scholars know that us has succulent, thriving pastures and corpses, so it was rich as far as uh, producing things there. They also know that it lay close to the Sibians and Chaldeans who raided them. Now Job has some friends and we'll get into them. Eliphaz. He was the first and most prominent of Job's three friends. He had come from a great distance to comfort an ailing buddy. They had come travel so that they could bring comfort to Job after all this had happened to him. Scriptures describe him as a distinguished thinker or sage of Teman in Eden, which was known for its wisdom. And that's taken from 
Jeremiah 49, 7. Bildad, he was the second friend to visit Job. A Shuhite, one of the sons of Abraham and Keturah, Abraham's second wife. From Genesis 25, 2. Job 2, 11, and the 8th chapter of the first verse. Bible scholars believe that Bildad's home was the Assyrian land of Shuhu, south of Haran, near the middle Euphrates River, Elihu. He was Job's young friend who raised the discussion of Job's suffering to a higher theological level. He tried to show a hurting Job the greater wisdom comes by inspiration instead of human experience and tradition. So far, he was also a friend and a counselor of Job. His home is unknown. But Bible scholars submit that it was in Eden or Northern Arabia. He agreed with Job's other friends in attributing Job's suffering to his sins and spoke bluntly and harshly to Job. In Job's day, trouble and suffering were viewed as the consequences of one's sin. And we have people today that, what happened to you? Why are you going through this? What did you do? And it's not always because you sin. It's just a test, a trial. For you to, so that you can get a better promotion. It was believed that since God is love and all powerful, he cannot be the source or cause of suffering. Moreover, it was reasoned that since God is holy and has zero tolerance for sin, he cannot let those who sin go unpunished. This line of thought led to the conclusion that sin is at the root of all suffering, trouble, and pain. Each of Job's peers, Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far, speaks from this vantage point. From their perspective, Job's tragic situation was evident of some unconfused sin in his life, or unconfessed sins, I'm sorry, in his life. For example, Eliphaz questioned Job, Job 4, 7, and then 8, in 22, chapter 5 and 6. Bildad also forces the perspective that sin is behind all suffering. Job 8, 3-6, and then 13. See also Job 18, 2. Zophar affirms the thought that Job's suffering is because of some sin in Job's life. In fact, Zophar proceeds to plead with Job to confess his sins in order that he might again experience God's peace. Job 11 verses 14 to 19. These assumptions, however, do not speak to Job's situation. Job is innocent. His defense begs the question, why do the righteous suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? And what are good people who suffer to do? Curse God or embrace their pain and recommit their lives to his care? What are good people to do when tragedy occurs and leave in its wake a torrent of suffering and trouble? Job is confident that God will eventually come to his aid and give him the resources he needs to go on trusting God and live. Creatively, with the suffering and pain, 
occasioned by tragedy. What faith? That is the faith that overcomes the world. This is the faith that overcomes anything and everything that life may hurl at those who dare to place their lives in God's hand. There was a book out, and there is still a book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it was very popular when I was working. And when that book was out, when it first came out, you couldn't keep a copy on the shelf. So that lets me know, let me know, that there were a lot of people who thought of themselves good, but were going through some situations. We know, those of us who are in Christ and who are maturing, that yes, we're going to go through some things. And bad things do happen to us. But this is why I know that this segment was put in God's Word in the Holy Bible to let us know you're going to go through some things. Just because you've given your life to Christ, does not mean that you are exempt from trouble, suffering, and pain. But we'll find out that when you go through these things, it's just a test. It's just a way for you to get a promotion so that you may be stronger and more voiceful to the cause of Christ. Our first segment of this lesson is Job's Tragedies. And it's taken from Job, the first chapter, verses 14 to 15. And it reads like this. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the men were plowing and the donkey feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servant with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped to tell this. A messenger arrived at Job's house with this news. Your oxen were plowing and the duck is feeding beside them. And when the Sabians raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farm hands. And I, the messenger, am the only one who escaped and I came to tell you. This is the beginning of sorrow for Job. The second part of it is Job's nonverbal response to his tragedies and is taken from verses 18 to 19. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thou sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smoked the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they were dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Truly, Job was a godly man who left no stones unturned in his devotion to God. Yet within a matter of seconds, he received the worst possible news from four messengers, one on the heels of the other. After one came, then another one, then another one, then another one came to give him a bad report. 
He was wiped out by natural calamity and the vicious attacks of men. All these tragedies were the work of the accuser, Satan, and had no idea that Satan was using him to challenge God. Nor did Job know that his suffering would be used by God to defeat Satan. Job's life had become a comeback zone where God and Satan battled for Job's allegiance. God was pleased to announce to Satan that Job was his unique and most faithful servant. Satan countered God's boast by charging that Job was faithful only because he enjoyed God's favor. In short, Satan told God that when his blessings cease to flow in Job's direction, he would curse thee to thy face. Job 1.11 for reasons known only to him, God responded to Satan's challenge in a way that would ultimately test Job's resolve to be faithful in the absence of divine blessings. As soon as God released Job unto Satan, power, Job was struck with a terrible series of tragedies. One after the other to the other to the other. Job was deprived of every material blessing and nearly all family and friendship ties. Job was completely stripped of all God's favor. Eventually, his health failed and he was left destitute. Satan had Job where he wanted him, namely outside of God's apparent protection. We should note, however, that Job's destitute position was due not to Satan's powers, but to God's power. The writer wants his reader to know that Satan could do nothing to Job without God's permission. Amen. While Job may not have been immediately aware of God's active and continuing intervention, he was aware of God's availability. Suffering may blind us to God's active intervention, but it needs not blind us to his availability. Amen. God is always available to us, even though we may not be able to see any evidence of his intervention. Faith enables us to see that God is always keeping watch over his own. Upon hearing the reports of tragic loss, Job remained silent. He didn't say a word at that particular time. The reader is informed of Job's silence by the writer's use of the poetic device while he, the messenger of Job, sent bad news, was yet speaking. This phrase implies that Job's first response to the tragedies reported to him was one of complete silence. The sudden news about the successive tragedies rendered Job speechless. He said nothing. Mm. Job is deeply shaken. He is able to express himself only with the mourning gestures known in ancient Israel. He rent, he tore his clothes and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. Silence is a natural first response 
to tragedy, which affects us personally. We cannot immediately put our feelings into words. We are shocked, amen, stunned, and in some ways traumatized. Words elude us. We can only cry and groan inwardly. We may even express ourselves in a primordial scream that express our sense of happiness in the face of circumstances. We wish we're different, but no, we cannot change our emotions swinging back and forth between anger and denial. Job, when he was told that his cattle and donkey and even the farm hands were swiped out. And while I can imagine this messenger leaving, another person comes in, Job, your children was at your oldest son's house. Make it merry. And a wind from the wilderness now came and swiped out the four corners of that and they fell on them and all ten of them are dead. You know, I have gone through tragic things. But to have ten people, your children, your flesh and blood to all be wiped out at one time. I heard one minister years ago say Job had 10 cooling boards in his house at one time. And you know that was a painful ordeal. But he did not say a word at that time. He probably couldn't. He probably just was uttering those things in his mind and his heart to the Lord. But the beautiful thing about this is that we read where Job was an upright man, holy and upright man for the Lord. And Satan, we read the whole chapter. It said he was going to and fro, up and down, seeing who he could mess with. And then God, God said, have you considered, did you think about my servant, my servant Job? And Satan said, you got a hedge around him. I can't get to him because he is so much into you. I, I, can't, I can't get through that. So God told him. You can touch him, but don't touch that soul. I'll slide the hedge over. I'll move the hedge. Because see, Satan wanted to say that Job was only serving and is faithful to God because God had made him healthy, had made him rich, and that's why he's devoted to you because of what you've done for him. But God knows us. And he asked Satan, Satan didn't ask him at first, he asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And for those of us who are in Christ, Satan goes every day accusing us. It calls him to accuse, accusing us. Yeah, they're serving you. They've got a good job. They got a nice house. They got a nice car. The children are all doing good and everything. Who wouldn't serve you? Well, he had it all too. 
If you think about it, he had it all too. But he let pride and jealousy enter into him because the Satan, he had a free will choice too. And God knew that. And you can't go above the Creator. And he was kicked out of heaven. So now he's going back and forth to see, trying to accuse people and be in competition, which he would never be with God. God said, consider, have you considered Job? But Job, even at this particular time, he tore his clothes, he rented it. A sign of his morning. He shaved his hair and he fell and wallowed on the ground because he was so hurt. He couldn't even say anything. And I know, even in a time in my life when I was going through, the only thing I could say was, You know, Lord. Y'all, I couldn't even really pray like I wanted to. Because I was hurting so bad. But I would say, you know, Lord. I need your help, Lord. Comfort me, Lord. And he did it. And God is the same God who still does the same thing right now. But we have to have that steadfast unmovable faith in Him. Amen. The third segment of our lesson is Job's faith responds to his tragedies and is taken from verse 22 of that first chapter. And it says, this is beautiful, y'all. And all this, all of what, what he had gone through, the, 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 the livestock and the farm hands being destroyed, his children being killed and destroyed, all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He gone through this, and he still sin not. You know, a lot of people, when they go through things, they want to blame God. Why God do this? If I'm serving, why this happen? Why not? Why not? If Christ went through things, if God permitted. His son to go, who do you think you are? It also said, and I used to read this, it said it pleased God that Jesus would go through this thing. You know why it pleased? Because he knew his son was doing exactly what he wanted him to do. And his son loved us so much until he knew he had to go through. He knew he had to have a period of separation from his father. And he did want that bitter cup to pass. But then he thought about that thing. He saw you. He saw me. And he said, Father, not my will, but whatever you want me to do. We need to have that same steadfast. Lord, I don't understand the situation. I'm not comfortable. This is not my comfort zone. But Lord, if I need to stay here. To witness to somebody. To help somebody. To exalt your name. So others can see that you live in me. Then so be it. Not my will. But your will. Job sinned not. Even though. The devil. Thought. See. He thought. That by this. Job would have cursed God. And given up. Faith. And God is a tremendous source of strength 
when one is facing tra tragic loss. Handling the personal stress occasioned by loss, <coughs> excuse me, occasioned by loss is one of the life's greatest challenge. And it requires a strong and viable faith. Yes, it does. William E. Holm has helpfully noted that Joe went from a position of prominence in the community to becoming the butt of scoffers. Is it also is instructed to know, however, that in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. This statement, which summarized Job's faith, respond to the tragedies that had befallen him, teaches at least two things about faith. The first is that faith is not dependent upon the constant flow of God's blessings. We should not base our relationship with God on what he can do for us. He will do far and beyond. But we should not be serving him so that we can be blessed wealth and prosperity. You see, it's a, Lord, if you never bless me, Anymore, you've already blessed me enough. And the more you get closer to God, the less you want. All of this stuff is going to fade away. We can't take any of this stuff with us. Wouldn't want to because it won't be worth anything. But God's word is. He's everlasting. To everlasting because he is God. So it should not be based on, well, Lord, I'm serving you because the Lord is going to bless me real good. When he woke you up this morning, he blessed you. If you truly let him save your soul, he has truly blessed you. And stop looking at God as some gimme, gimme, gimme person. He loved us so much until he gave all of himself so that we may have an inheritance with him. This statement, again as I say, which summarizes Job's faith response to the tragedies that had befallen him teaches at least two different things about faith. The first is that faith, faith is not dependent upon the constant flow of God's blessings. And second, while faith may be tested and is often severely shaken, it is not necessarily destroyed by tragic loss. Although the culmination of Job's losses did not destroy his faith, it did create for him a religious problem. Best summarized in the question, what kind of God would allow these tragic things to, me, to happen to me when I have been so faithful to him? And I've had people, even, and I, I'm sure they meant well, they had not matured in that. Why this happen to y'all? Why did y'all go through that? Just like Job's friends. When they came and they just looked at him for seven, they just looked at him. And then they became judgmental in their own and then they said well what did you do for you to be going through all this surely 
You must have done some great sins. Or you sin. You need to repent. But Job hadn't sinned. This was what God was sending him through. And that's why we too have to be careful when we're counseling or, or trying to comfort someone. What did you do? Did you do this? Did you do that? That's for that person and God. You just give them the word. And don't try to be the judge. God needs no assistance with that. Because he knows. Job was going through those things because, as he said, the devil. Satan was seeing who was really faithful to God. He's doing us the same way. Oh, they're, they're serving you, Lord, because you blessed them so. They've got this, that, and the other. But Lord, if you took this away, they wouldn't serve you as much. That's why I love Psalms 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. And His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I was given that scripture personally almost 30 years ago. Because the Lord knew that I was going to, was about, I was on the eve of getting ready to go through some tragic stuff. And he had to put that in my spirit. That Pat, you and your family are going to go through some things. That will probably have an effect to you, on you for the rest of your life. But I need you to continue to trust, love, and depend on me. And I need to use you. My servant, to show the world that whatever happens, you can depend on me and that you will serve me. I thank God because when I was going through, I too had friends to say, Why this happened to y'all? Why y'all? And then the Spirit came to me and said, why not? You've been testifying. Living it. For me you live and for me you die. That there is no other God before me. So now it's testing time. Were you just talking that? Or do you believe it? And as I said one day. And the words came to me. I said, Lord, help me, help me, even though I'm going through this, help me to see the glory, and help me, Lord, even though I'm going through, help me not to give up, and help me most of all to represent you. I don't want to shame you, Lord. Because whether you bless me again, I'm going to still bless you. Because I know that you will never leave me nor forsake me. And that too, I'm going through. But I know I'm going to continue to trust you and not doubt. Because I know, Lord, that you will bring me out. And you know what? He did it. And he's still doing it. Sometimes I walk through this house. And I say, nobody but you, Lord. Nobody but you. Lord, when I was in trouble, you brought me over. You, Lord, brought me over. Nobody but you, Lord. Nobody but you. 
And I can imagine Brother Job, those friends sitting there looking at him, trying to be little judges in themselves. I can imagine him saying, Lord, I don't understand all this. But I know that my Redeemer lives. I get excited when I think of the goodness of Jesus. The goodness of God and all he does. I don't know about you, but my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. For saving me. I thank you Lord. For you. Considering me. Your child. Your vessel. Your servant. To be able to go through this. Because God never. Sends his servants out. Without being equipped. You may not have experience. Anything tragic yet. But God is already fashioning you, equipping you. So when it's time for you to go out there on that battlefield, you'll be strong enough, strengthened enough to stand and fight the battle. Because He will equip you. I don't care what the enemy may put before you or behind you. He can't do anything what's inside of you. Okay? He can only march around the outside. But when God lives on the inside, he can't do anything with you. Because God say, that belongs to me. That's one of mine. Yeah, you may aggravate it like a little gnat, but you better not touch, bother, because the inside of her is me, is mine. The inside of him is mine. The inside of you is mine. So we just trust God and know that whatever we go through, He's right there with us. He hasn't left us. He's right there with us. And we're about to end this beautiful lesson. And our fourth segment is Job's faith bogs down in despair. We'll get a little rip weary. And we're moving on to the third chapter, and we're taking it from verses, <coughs> excuse me, 1 to 3, and then verse 11. And it reads like this, and get a little water here. Excuse me, thank you. After this, <laughs> Job opened his mouth. And curse this day. He opened his mouth. He hated the day that he was born. I don't know. A lot of people want to think. Because February is one of the shortest months of all of our 12, year, 12 month calendar. That that's when he was born. Sometime in February. Because the, 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 the month is cut very short. And it said, this is Job speaking, when he did speak, he said, let the day, <coughs> excuse me, perish wherein I was born. And the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? 
In other words, all of this has happened. He got a little weary. And he was like, Lord, I'm going through all of this. Why did you let me come forth? Why didn't I die in my mother's womb? Why didn't I die when I came out? That's how hurt and things were really piling in on him. Why was I born? Some of you ask the same question. When things happen in your life, Some people, you see, suicide rates are going up and up and up and up. In essence, they're saying, I hate the day I was born. I'm worthless. Why was I born? Why didn't God just take me? Why did I have to go through this? Why? 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 But God, He knows. And a lot of people, when you were in Egypt land, there have been times when I've even said, Lord, why do I have to go through this? Why? Why, why was I born? And I want to say this. A lot of us were born out of wedlock. Okay? A lot of us was told what you was wrong. It was a mistake. No, you were not. God doesn't make mistakes, okay? He put you here for a reason. He put you here for a reason. A lot of these children that are here who were not with two couples married, with a couple that was married when they were conceived, sometimes can turn out to be the best children that you've ever seen. You're not a mistake. God has a purpose for your life. He wanted you to be here. If he didn't, it could have been naturally aborted right then. But he said, mm-mm. I just want to give you another little tidbit. Mary and Joseph, when Mary uh, conceived Jesus from the Holy Spirit, okay? It was not a man. From the Holy Spirit. She was not married to Joseph. She was engaged, but she was not yet married to Joseph. And Joseph wanted to not let shame be on. He was going to marry her privately. But an angel came to him and said, Do not think that this thing that Mary is carrying is from a man. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit he impregnated her. In other words, you go on and do the right thing by her. Because it was not another man's seed. It is directly from God Almighty. But our Lord and Savior. When I first heard that, I was like, what? But you know why I believe that God allowed that to happen? Jesus was acquainted with everything that we go through in this life. Isaiah said he was a man of sorrow, acquainted me. He understood. So, during that time scope, he saw that I was going to come forth. You were going to come forth. It wasn't a mistake. God meant for us to be here for such a time as this. 
He came through this world for such a time as that. And he died for every mankind. It was only to, up to the person if they wanted to accept what he did on Calvary. I did, I'm sure. And I pray that you will too, or have already done it. But what if Christ had not come? What if he would have given up because he was not treated kindly? They did not treat our God kindly on the face of this earth. But he went all the way anyhow. And Job got a little weary. And he said, Why? That I not from the womb. Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? I said, because Job, I didn't want you to. I had plans for you. I had plans that in 2023, they're still reading about you. And to see how you went through all of this tragedy. How you lost everything. How your health failed you. How your relatives, even your wife, said, why don't you just get it over with Job? She was tired too. And, well, you know, we, we look at her as <coughs> a bad, bad person. But you know what? She lost her children too. She became poor too. She had to look at a man who was sick with sores all over him. She was going through too. So she was saying, Joe, why don't you just go ahead and die? Just curse God, God and go ahead and die. But even that, he said, uh-uh. You speaking crazy, honey. You, you, you're not speaking. You're speaking as a foolish woman. He had to go through those things all by himself. God had a plan. God is going to deliver Job. And we're getting ready to wrap this up now. And it says, The religious problems that Job faced brought him to a very edge of despair. His days of silence had ended. His days of questioning God's mysterious ways with those who trusted him had begun. Job began to, <coughs> excuse me, entertain thoughts that caused him to have some doubts about God's fairness and justice. Job knew that he had done everything he could to sustain an ever-growing and intimate relationship with God. When he could not understand, however, was why God has ceased bestowing his blessings. Job wanted desperately to know why God had withdrawn his care and favor. We tend to be well versed in faith capacity to believe. We must have, we must, we have much homework spiritual work to do, however. If we are to embrace the faith capacity to doubt or to at least question God's way with us, doubt is not faith enemy, nor is it the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Unbelief says there is no God with which to discuss the tragedies of life. Faith that dares to doubt says there is a God whose ways I do not understand. Therefore, I will be honest about my doubts and pray that God will entertain my question in his own time. Reassure me of his care and guidance. I just want to say this too. God does not mind 
you answering, asking him a question. Ah, oh, don't question God. He wants you to ask him questions. He wants you to talk to him. But he wants you to listen. And he wants you to know that I'm going to give you the right answer. And you have to accept my answer. But when I'm going through, I say, Lord, help my unbelief. I need to be reassured. I need your hand. I'm trusting you, Lord, because see, my dependency is not in myself because I've let myself down so many times. But I'm depending and trusting you, Lord, to show me the way because I know you are the way. So don't think that you can't ask God. He wants you to be honest with him. He already knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. Talk to him about it. And he will make it clear. Job's religious problem is coming to all who are challenged to live with the terrible consequences of tragedy. Have you ever been in a tragic situation? And ask God for help. Yes. Only to feel. That he was not helping at all. You waited and waited. You kept on petitioning God. To intervene. And change your circumstances. And things grew worse. Yeah. Job is not hesitant. About exercising. The faith to engage. With doubt. His first step toward dealing with his doubt involves being honest with himself. Honest enough to admit his sense of anguish and despair over God's treatment of him. Job is to be commended for having the kind of faith that takes doubt seriously. He opened his mouth and he cursed his day, not God, but his day. In other words, Job's situation of loss, coupled with his bewilderment about God's ways, result in his desire to die without having lived. Job is not threatening suicide here. Whether, rather, he is lamenting the day of his birth. He reasons that if he had not been born, he would not have experienced the tragedies that had brought him to the point of despair. Tragedy is a part of living in a fallen world. Moreover, God has not promised people faith of a life free of tragedy. <coughs> Excuse me. However, he has promised to be with us during those times. In the face of tragedy, we may, like Job, rue the day of our birth. But let us pray that at the end of the day, our faith and our continued dialogue with God about our doubts would give us the spiritual resources necessary to live victoriously with the consequences of the tragedy. Job went through. He went through. But after he had gone through, and it's a long book, after he had gone through, even with the sickness and all of these things, he never gave up on God. He got a little doubtful, but he remained a servant of the Most High God. And God, when he saw this, and saw that he had done well, he blessed him even more than when he had blessed him at first. 
because he knew that it was not the things or the people, but he trusted him. So he made him to have a beautiful duration of his life. We're going to go through some things. <coughs> I don't know what all I may go through before I leave this earth. But that's why I want to build up the heavenly bank account. Because you know, there may be, may be a time that we have to withdraw. That's why even now when you don't want to go or you're tired and you ask the Lord, help me. And he gives you the strength to go on. You know what you're doing? You're building up that timber. One day, you're going to have to reach in there and grab that strength. But if you never put anything in, you won't have anything to draw out. I thank God. No, I don't cross every T or dot every I. But Lord, I try to remember to do those things. Because our goal is for the Lord to be satisfied. Our goal is to trust Him, to serve Him, whatever situation we may be in. For the rest of my life, I'll serve Him. And I thank Him. He's done so much for me. He's done for you too. Trust in God through the hardship. Trust in God when you're hurting. Trusting and serving and witnessing for the cause of Christ. When it looks like there's nothing, nothing but darkness. But then there is darkness. Because if a hint of light enters that room, there's no longer total darkness. You'll be able to see something. And we are an illumination of the light. We're not, but we're a reflection of the light of Jesus Christ. So when we go through those situations and we have to go and minister to someone who may be going through, who needs their hope, who needs to be encouraged, when the light comes in the room, we are to tell them about the light giver. And yes, you may be going through some things now. Maybe your children, your spouse, your job. You may not live in the best of houses or maybe your car is putting all the way down the street and you hope you don't it doesn't stop at the stop sign. Maybe you got just a little bit of money. But God can take what you have. And if you trust him, he will make a way. He will provide. And most of all, he will give you a satisfied, and I mean a satisfied peace and mind in him. Remember, and I'm going to close. Most of us came from very humble beginnings. I can remember even some of my grandparents and <coughs> great grandparents living in a three room house 
four room house. And I mean, there were children, but they made do. Didn't have a whole lot of food, but mama could get in there and knead that dough and make the best biscuits and some molasses and fat back. You ate. No, it wasn't the best, but yes, it was. Because they did it with love. And God, right now, we can't even duplicate that like it was back then. Because it was a blessing from God. Whatever state, Brother Paul said, that I'm in, I've learned to be content. Job had to learn to be content. Even when he had to go through this hardship, these hardships, the Lord had to show him that Job, I'm still with you. And one of the verses that I love when he said, though you slay me, knock me down, I'm going to still serve you. Though you slay me, Lord, I'm going to still serve you. Is that your plea today? Lord, I don't know. I'm going through some things. And I'm down right now. But I'm going to still give you the praise. I'm going to still serve you. I'm not going to let the world influence me to go out here and do something that's not in your will. Don't you slay me. Yet will I trust you. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours. I hope you have gotten some nuggets out this lesson. God is good. If you don't know the Lord for the free part of your sins, you can do that right now. Lord, I'm down. I may be on drugs. I may be an alcoholic. I may be a homewonger. I may be a gambler, a robber, a killer, a busybody, a backstabber. But you know what? We serve a God that can clean you up. And you won't have to go around saying, Oh, I'm a disgust. I'm a mistake. I'm a nobody. That's who God deals with. He saved me. He saved you. Do it today. Don't put it off any longer. If you're in a backslidden way, get up. Repent. And get back out there. I just want to thank you all for watching. We pray, Lord, that your Shekinah glory reach the masses, that somebody will be saved, delivered, and set free through this ministry. Like us on Facebook, give us a thumb up, and most of all, pray for us. I lift you up, Aunt Shirley, Aunt Ina, May, Sister Loretta, and Sister Iris Hatchet, the Thompsons, the Nelsons. All of my my friends, my mother-in-law, Alberta Brown, my brother and sister-in-laws, I lift you up. I pray for you. And most of all, I'm praying for each of those bereaved families that I mentioned earlier. He's a comforter. He's a comforter. And the Word of God tells us not to mourn like we don't have the hope. We mourn. And we do lament, but you lift your eyes to the hills for once cometh your help, because we know all of your help, if you trust her now, comes from him. Thank you, Nicole. I love you. Thank you for making this possible. You just don't know how much of a blessing you are to Pastor Brown and myself. And thank you, Pastor Brown, my dear love, for making this possible too and fixing this up for me so that we can come to you 
We love you. I love you. And God loves you best. And if it's God's will, we'll see you the next time. Our next week lesson will be taken from Psalms. The 47th chapter, division of Psalms. Psalms, the 47th divisions, verses 1 through 9. And we just thank God. That title is God's Rule Over the Nation. Amen. I love you, my brother. I love you, my sister. And if it's God's will, and I know it is, I'll see you on the next time. I love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.